Good morning. Um, and thank you for those uh, introductions. You, uh, you know, I've been to Hawaii once and, and I can say that you folks really know how to make people feel welcome. And, um, you know, it's wonderful that that extends virtually as well. Thank you. Um, you've, uh, you. You've made this so much easier already. <laughs> um, I don't know about the rest of you, but the virtual world has its challenges. And uh, so um, hopefully we have um, uh, come, come above them all, all today. So. Um, so I am, I'm Alice, I'm coming to you from Tampa, Florida today, um, and um, I have been uh, involved in medical cannabis for some 45 years, um, <laughs> which is just mind-boggling every time I say it, um, but um, it, what it does mean is that I use the, the terms cannabis and marijuana interchangeably. Um, you know, it, it's something I've tried to break myself of, but I can't um, because prior to about 1995, 96, somewhere in there, it was always medical marijuana. Um, so um, forgive me if I offend any, any purist um, and use the term marijuana. So um, I'm very happy to be here. Um, I want to talk a little bit about my husband because he's one of my favorite topics. Um, but I also want to talk about um, the role that Hawaii had in the, the very early days. And I'm talking back to 1977, 1978, when Hawaii took some steps that were so significant in advancing the, um, the infant medical cannabis reform um, effort at that point. Um, there's been a lot that has happened um, in uh, in medical cannabis here in the 21st century. And it's really easy to lose sight of just how long this struggle has been. And um, it's, it's very easy to lose sight of the contributions of people from the early days. Um, and one of the things that I try to do is, is keep those memories alive. Um, so I, I like to say that Robert and I got into the uh, marijuana movement the old fashioned way, um, we got busted. Um, it was 1975, and we were arrested for cultivation and possession of marijuana. We were living in D.C. at the time, Washington, D.C., and the charges against us were, uh, were only misdemeanors. We could have paid a fine, walked away from it, um, and that would have been very easy. But there was a problem. Um, Robert had glaucoma, diagnosed just three years before when he was 24 years old. He was already legally blind in one eye and had lost significant vision in the other. And the ophthalmologist tried every available medication to lower Robert's eye pressures, um, but they remained dangerously high and unchanged. And it was the simple fact that Robert was losing sight um, with every, every passing day. Um, Robert and I had met in college in the late 1960s, and as you can probably tell from this picture, we were hippies. Um, we enjoyed inhaling marijuana whenever we could. Um, I graduated in 1969 with a degree in technical theater. Actually, I, I didn't become a nurse until after Robert's death in 2001. Um, my initial training was in technical theater, and I set off to, uh, to find the world. Robert, meanwhile, uh, remained in school at the University of South Florida, um, where he got his master's degree in, in rhetoric, which, as you may know, is the art of public persuasion. And I, I can say uh, categorically that Robert had no idea um, how well that degree would serve him in the coming years. Um, after college, uh, Robert moved to Washington, D.C., hoping to become a speechwriter, um, but he ended up driving a cab. This is his cabbie license from 1972. Um, and it was in that occupation that he found out just how bad um, his, his ocular condition was. Um, as I said, he went to see the ophthalmologist and none of the combinations of conventional medications were helping to lower the uh, eye pressure for Robert. His, his Eyes were already severely compromised, which made surgery extremely risky. And uh, Robert was told he'd be blind by the time he was 30. 
Um, so Robert smoked marijuana right up until he moved to Washington, D.C., which was at the end of 1971. He had no connections in Washington, and thus he had no pot. Um, and it was during this period that his, his glaucoma became extremely aggressive. Um, and, you know, with hindsight being 2020, um, we, we realized that Robert was unwittingly medicating uh, his glaucoma during our time in college. Um, after his diagnosis in September of 1972, Robert quit driving a cab for obvious reasons. Um, he was forced onto welfare for a short period of time, but then he connected with some independent newspapers, began writing various articles and theater reviews, and secured a part-time teaching job, um, and would make friends who would eventually lead him to a renewed supply of marijuana. One night in his Virginia apartment, uh, Robert looked out the window and, and saw what he now knew was a telltale sign of elevated pressures, um, halos around streetlights. Um, another manifestation is whiteouts, which occur during the day. Um, he was depressed, and so he decided to enjoy a joint that had been given to him by a newfound friend. He put on some music, got himself a cold drink, uh, settled into a comfortable chair, had a good smoke, and probably had a good book to read, if, if I know Robert. Um, about a half an hour later, 40 minutes later, he got up and went back to the kitchen and looked out the same window and was thunderstruck by what he saw, or I should say what he didn't see. Um, the halos were gone. And in our 1998 book, Marijuana Rx, The Patient's Fight for Medicinal Pot, Robert wrote about this, this particular experience. It was a singular moment, and I immediately drew the connection between the use of marijuana and the now absent halos. Indeed, parts of my brain absorbed the connection so quickly and so assuredly that I was certain I must be stoned, which of course I was. I tried to follow the exploding synaptic spasm, but was quickly left behind. The thought was too fast, too large and complex to pursue and understand, to place into words. I could do little more than smile at the building delusion. Marijuana beneficial? Mm, a delicious thought, perhaps, but nothing to hang your sight on. As a side note, I always like to say that this was Robert getting introduced to his endocannabinoid system, but that's a story for another day. Um, we need to stop the story here for a moment and get better acquainted with the times. In 1972, there was no medical marijuana, no medical cannabis, none, nada, zilch. And, you know, it may be difficult to wrap your head around that fact, but it's the truth. The nation's first drug commissioner, Harry Onslinger, best known for the Marijuana Tax Act of 1937, had personally waged a nearly three decade war against marijuana and systematically removed all vestiges of cannabis medical use. In 1942, he saw to it that cannabis was removed from the US pharmacopoeia and that, coupled with the rise of many new and exciting pharmaceuticals, really marked the death knell for medical cannabis. <clears throat> it was dropped from the pharmacopoeia and medical curriculums, and a generation of doctors and pharmacists would learn absolutely nothing about cannabis. So when Robert made his momentous observation of the absent halos in 1972, he thought he had discovered something completely new. He methodically set out to prove or disprove his theory. And then once he convinced himself that marijuana was indeed helping him, he told me, and I laughed. Um, but with the passage of time, it became apparent that Robert could see better um, when we had the marijuana. We told no one, especially Robert's doctor, because he, the doctor was extremely pleased that Robert's eye pressures now seemed to be miraculously under control and, and no doubt thought it was something that he was doing magically with his medical stuff. Um, we feared if we told the doctor about marijuana, 
um, that the doctor would summarily discharge Robert as an addict and no doubt a quack. Um, you know, I, it, it all sounds incredibly naive today, but it's important to understand that while recreational pot smoking was, was just rampant in the US at this point, medical use of marijuana was unheard of. And so after our arrest, when we explained Robert's use of marijuana to the, to the lawyer, we saw, we saw a reaction that would become routine. There would be a smirk, maybe a stifled laugh, and then a simple admonition to, uh, well, prove it, just prove it. Um, and, and so we did. Um, in 1976, Robert prevailed in proving his medical need for marijuana in both the criminal court, which found him not guilty by reason of medical necessity, and in a civil petition that resulted in his gaining legal access to federal supplies of marijuana. It was big news. Um, I have to say, and um, it really is, it's a great story with a lot of twists and turns that I don't have time to cover today. So I, you know, encourage all of you who want to know more about the early days of medical marijuana to, to read my book, um, Medical Marijuana in America, Memoir of a Pioneer, which is available um, on Amazon. Um, Robert wasn't the only individual to accidentally discover that marijuana had medical value, of course. Um, and after the publicity in his case, we began to hear from other patients, some with glaucoma, some with cancer, and we quickly discovered there was already a network of cancer chemotherapy patients who were sharing the news that, that marijuana could help uh, quell the nausea and vomiting. But there were all kinds of other diseases, multiple sclerosis, migraine headaches, epilepsy, skin conditions, Crohn's disease, all manner of things that some of which we had never heard of. And Robert and I were just dumbfounded. There, there was this silent army that had quietly been using marijuana for years to medicate. Um, and now they had a voice in Robert Randall. And so they called us, we collected names um, and a movement was born. NORML, the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws, was, uh, which by the way is celebrating its 50th anniversary, um, and there you see a very, very young picture of Keith Straub. Um, NORML became a very strong ally and, and started sending Robert to speaking engagements all around the country. They actually asked him to come work um, at NORML, but he was reluctant to become attached to to a group that advocated decrim or general legalization, Robert felt it was important that the two facets of cannabis use, medical and social, be kept separate. But frankly, we needed the income. Robert had resigned his teaching job and theater work in DC was hit and miss at the best of times. So, um, and we also needed help with all of these people who were contacting us with communicating to them. So we suggested that Normal hire me, which they did. Um, and I set up the Normal Medical Reclassification Project um, beginning in January of 1978. Um, now, it's at this point in the story that Hawaii makes an entrance. As I was setting up my office at Normal headquarters in Washington during the first few days of January 1978, Robert was in Hawaii. I was so jealous. He had been invited by Hawaiian cannabis reformer, High Greenstein, to come and testify at hearings being chaired by Senator Anson Chong. And uh, they concerned a, a report from the Hawaiian Public Health Service, their marijuana task force. I wonder how many Hawaiians remember this groundbreaking report. It was short, no more than 30 pages, and consisted of a review of available research at the time, what we call today a meta-analysis. And quite frankly, there wasn't very much research at that time. But it was an official report from a reputable source. And more importantly, it was very enthusiastic about medical uses. So Robert returned with a copy of that report and told me that Senator Chong planned to introduce legislation that would authorize medical use of marijuana for glaucoma, cancer chemotherapy, and asthma. 
and he wanted to establish an intrastate program of manufacture uh, and distribution through the Hawaiian State Health Department. Ultimately, it would become the first such law to be introduced in the US, but it would not be the first medical marijuana law to pass. That honor would go to New Mexico. In, 19, in December of 1977, about a month before Robert traveled to Hawaii, we met a young cancer patient at the Normal Conference in Washington. His name was Lynn Pearson, and he was from New Mexico and wanted medical marijuana to be legalized, not just for himself, but for others with cancer who wouldn't try marijuana because of its illegality. Lynn was receiving chemo at the VA hospital in Albuquerque, and he was using cannabis to successfully combat the nausea and vomiting. And, but when he encouraged other veterans to, to use marijuana, they all declined because of the drug's illegality. And Lynn wanted to change that. Robert and Lynn became, well, they really clicked. I mean, they become, became such good friends so quickly. And they were like lieutenants in a war, a war for the hearts and minds of, of America. Robert understood that Lynn had something that we didn't. He had a state legislature. Remember, we, we lived in Washington, D.C. at the time. So Robert encouraged Lynn to approach his state, rep his state representatives and see if they would help. Well, Lynn was an extraordinary man. He took on this task with an energy that was belied by his gaunt frame and his shallow cheeks. He was relentless in stalking the halls of New Mexico, the New Mexico legislation, but he needed documents, he needed some help, and he encouraged the folks at the New Mexico Legislative Council Services to call Alice at the Normal Medical Reclassification Project. I had just taken the Hawaiian report and repackaged it into a spiral-bound booklet. New Mexico would receive one of the very first copies. On January 25th, 1978, Senator Chong's legislation was introduced in Hawaii, and we immediately forwarded it to Lynn in New Mexico. And while the New Mexico legislators thought it was a good start, they knew that New Mexico would not authorize cultivation and distribution intrastate. For a while, they considered using confiscated supplies, but the risk of contamination was too great the cost of analyzing it too much. And frankly, there was a real fear of legal jeopardy because federal officials threatened to close down the program if they use confiscated supplies. In the end, New Mexico hit upon a solution that Robert and Lynn and I worried about, but we did feel it was one that the legislators would embrace. The New Mexico Controlled Substances Therapeutic Research Act authorized the New Mexico Department of Health to establish a statewide program of research for glaucoma and cancer patients using federal supplies of marijuana, just like the ones that Robert received. The New Mexico bill really flew through hearings and on February 11th, it was passed in the House 53 to nine. On February 21st, uh, or it flew through the Senate 33 to one, three days later. And on February 21st, Governor Jerry Apodaca signed the bill. The United States had its first medical marijuana bill, but it would not be the last. In that same year, remember we're talking 1978, in that same year, Florida, Louisiana, and Illinois would adopt the New Mexico model. And in the next year, 11 more states would adopt marijuana bills based on the New Mexico model. And in 1980, there were even more. By the time Ronald Reagan took office in 1981, there were 34, ironically, that's how many we have now, there were 34 states with medical marijuana, authorized medical marijuana programs, all based on the New Mexico uh, model. And every one of those states received copies of the Hawaiian report, cop courtesy of the normal reclassification process project. Honestly, I mailed out hundreds of the Hawaiian reports um, to patients, to legislators, to doctors. Um, it was such a great tool. 
the New Mexico model was was a great, great start towards reform and re-educating the public, but it was flawed in many ways. The, the biggest problem was the supply source. The, the states naively thought that the federal government had enough marijuana to supply all of these programs. Um, it, they didn't, <laughs> and nor would they grow anymore. Um, in the end, only about five states would secure sufficient supplies to conduct research. And the results were very positive, and they were also completely ignored by the federal government. Lynn Pearson died before ever receiving federal supplies. But he'd had an enormous impact on his state, so much so that 20 years later, when New Mexico voters finally approved a state medical cannabis law that would establish an intrastate program, it would, it would be named after Lynn Pearson. I'm, I'm about out of time here, but I want to share these last thoughts with you. I, I learned long ago that there is no silver bullet. There is no one thing that will make right the injustice that Harry Unslinger and other drug warriors put in play more than 80 years ago. It will take consistent energy and focus to resolve the problems we have and importantly, to retain the progress that we've made. Congress reform, cannabis reform requires the cumulative efforts of many individuals. The Hawaiian report demonstrates how a single effort can resonate across many lives and efforts. It played a critical role in igniting this important reform. And I encourage all of you to continue the good work that your own medical cannabis reformers have left for you. The medical cannabis movement is stronger for Hawaii's contributions. And on behalf of all those who can no longer say it, let me say, mahalo. Thank you.